welcome back to the Water to Water podcast with Kristen and Kevin James. And today we've got something sensitive. We've got something contentious to talk to you about, such as sermons that we hear at church and the practice of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the church. Yeah, this is going to be a sensitive topic that we're talking about, but I still do think it's really important that we address it. And we feel like we can give a lot of disclaimers on this <laughs> podcast, but this one's important. So I'll start by saying that we're obviously not experts or teachers of the law, and we don't want to come across as Pharisees who claim to know everything. That's really not the place we're coming from. But we've just come to certain conclusions after studying the scripture in more detail. And when we looked at our experience of taking part in the Pentecostal church. So we're just giving our perspective on that. Right. Since we've come to certain conclusions, there will inevitably be questions raised about, or not questions, statements raised such as, oh, you shouldn't judge people who do things a certain way. And my response to that is, it's going to be quite cutthroat. The scripture does the talking, not us. So when we've come to a certain conclusion, we're using scripture and we're backing with scripture. Uh, to the point that Christian made where people are going to get offended or people might you know, take issue with this, we have to come to a realization, not just as a church, but as a community, is that whenever we talk about something that is important, there is a high chance or a high risk that somebody else will get offended by what we're talking about. If it is something important, if it is something that people hold deep to their heart, there is a high likelihood that people are going to be offended. Now, one response to this problem could be, well, if we think it's going to cause offense, let's not talk about it at all. Let's leave that topic untouched. The topic just keeps going under the radar. It's like the emperor with no clothes. Everyone can see that the emperor has no clothes, but we're too scared to point it out. Rather than coming and pointing out and actually saying, hey, emperor, you don't have any clothes on. But instead, we decide to lie to the emperor and lie and tell the emperor, well, you are wearing the most amazing royal clothes when he's not really wearing any clothes at all. So that's one way to respond. Or two, we could do what the little child says and point it out to the emperor saying, hey, you're actually not wearing any clothes. And so that's the way we're going about it. We're saying, well, this might cause offense. It might cause issues to people, but we still need to talk about this. People will have to sit and think about their beliefs. And we think it is important to talk about this. And that is where we are coming from. So if you guys have been listening to us, you know that I've grown up in the Pentecostal church since like the age of two. So that's all I've ever really known about church. And wherever we went as a family, we went to a Pentecostal church. So my beliefs, my practices, the way I see God, the way I see the Holy Spirit, Jesus, everything has been shaped by what I've been taught from the church. And the things that I've gained from the church have been absolutely invaluable because this is where I got saved. This is where I fully started to understand what the sacrifice of Jesus meant. So I'm completely indebted to my Sunday school teachers, pastors, and everyone who actually led me through those seasons in the Pentecostal church. And, you know, I th- I'm sure you could say the same thing as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah. Completely yeah. agree. Uh, completely condone everything you've said. Yeah. And you'll be talking about your experience about coming into the Pentecostal church as well in a later episode. But, you know, I think you agree with me that we are definitely indebted to the church mm-hmm. for that. And having said that, You know, every church and every group of humans who come together to start to worship God, they will have holes in their philosophy and theology. They'll have holes in their practices, things that perhaps don't 100% align with scriptures. And we've discussed this a couple of times privately, and you've said many times that you don't think there's actually a perfect church on this earth where everything is to the T, because we're humans and where there are humans, there will be mistakes. Uh, But God is still merciful in that. And he has been sustaining the global church and growing it. However, like I said, there are holes in these ideologies. And I think we've come to discover some of these. And certainly, as I grew up in the church, I've started to discover some of these. So growing up in the church, that's all I ever knew. And um, at first, I took it as the truth. You know, I took everything as the truth. There's no error in what the doctrine of the church is teaching. And I say I kept thinking this until maybe if I look back at my life, in the last seven years of my life, where I started thinking more critically uh, about some of the teachings. And by critically, I'm not saying being sceptical about everything that the church does and all the beliefs, but certainly I've learned to start searching scriptures more 
to see whether the practices and beliefs held by our churches are 100% true in comparison to the scriptures. Okay, uh, another opportunity to clarify a few of the terms that we're using. Uh, when we say church in this episode, we mean specifically the Pentecostal church. And when we say the Pentecostal church, we don't necessarily mean that it's uh, the London Pentecostal church. Of course, London Pentecostal church is a Pentecostal church. However, it is different to many other types of Pentecostal church. Uh, Pentecostal churches range from the charismaniac beliefs that you see in uh, Bethel and Jesus culture churches to the other side of the aisle where you've got churches like the traditional Calvary churches, which are very Bible based, but still believe in the holiness, the pursuit of holiness aspect and believing in the active work of the Holy Spirit. So just wanted to clarify that as we get into this episode, we are not talking about uh, the London Pentecostal Church specifically, but just Pentecostal churches in general. Yeah, I really think that it's important that you mention that because we don't want people to misunderstand and feel like we're slating off our own church. Uh, we're actually really lucky to be in a church where the scripture is given such importance and we're constantly exposed to the word of God in various ways. For example, like obviously the Sunday church services. And we also have weekly cell meetings and Bible study groups and things like that. So we're really lucky in that sense. But I do think that COVID was a turning point for many people in various different ways. They either improved, you know, and got better or got worse in some way. And I don't think there was uh, an in-between really. Uh, sorry, what, when you say improved or got worse what do you mean exactly by that? i just mean generally in every sense of the way like you either put on weight or you really <laughs> okay time, all right you okay pack, you know okay um, i thought you meant more in the, in the spiritual sense yeah i'm coming to that okay um but like i was saying you know with a lot of christians not just me um i think covid was a turning point a lot of people's eyes were open during that time because we had a lot of time to sit and reflect we had a lot of time to look through scripture and for us obviously we were exposed to millions of messages in yep. our church yeah we had daily meetings in the evening through zoom and i really don't know how our pastor knows all these different people but i do rate him for the way he organized and put together a program where every single night we had a different person speaking for i'd say over a year yeah he's a well-connected man our pastor yeah shout out to him <laughs> uh, and i'm not kidding when i say that every single night there were people from our church who again i really rate them for this uh, for example my father-in-law uh, they would listen to every single one of them. And, you know, it was really helpful for them. Uh, but anyway, as we were being exposed to different messages, not just from th our church um, and through these meetings, but also through different churches, thanks to the boom in online media, we were able to access so many different preachers, so many different tools that we previously didn't really bother to access or we didn't really even know they existed. So as we were being exposed to more and more of these messages and more and more of these pastors and more and more of these ideas and doctrines, some of which were conflicting, it came to a point where I, we could not help but have to refer to scripture to see, right, I've got all these different things, which one is true? And I'd say personally, the more I delved into scripture, the more I realized that some of the teachings are founded on the self. Some of the teachings taught by the Pentecostal churches are very me-centered and you know, everything revolves around us, you know, your material needs, your self-worth and things like that. And it made me realize that a lot of this is just unfounded surface level teaching and that there's so much more that we need as Christians. And there was a sometimes a disconnect. For example, the situation was really bad. There were thousands and th upon thousands of people dying, millions in the end of people dying because of COVID. And the messages that we were hearing rather than declaring the confidence that we have in in jesus the the blood of the cross how christ is ruler of everything how jesus says you know uh, you will have troubles in this world but i've conquered the world so that's what jesus is saying and all these promises that he's left for us instead of focusing on that it was very much fear mongering and sometimes we've got to look at ourselves and think well this is all going on in the world but you know jesus has given us so many words of comfort and perhaps there was less of that and some of these messages right were completely unrelated to what people needed to hear for example uh, we organized a lot of or we were part of the team let's say that organized a lot of um, english worship uh, for our church now bearing in mind english worship tends to have a higher percentage of youth attending it and people would come on there would always talk about the same thing. It was always about David or Daniel or Joseph. 
and about how they conquered in their youth all the troubles that came their way. Now, I'm not saying those stories aren't important. They are important. But listening to that every single Sunday can be quite sickening. And I still remember this, uh, teaching Sunday School over Zoom. And I asked once to my class, well, what was the sermon about today? And they said it was about Joseph. I said, what about last week? And they said, it was about Joseph. And I said, what about the week before that? And then one of the girls said, I'm pretty sure it was about Joseph. And so it was just baby stuff. You know, it was just milk, feeding people milk when they need solid food. And as a committee, we came and we spoke to each other and we said, listen, folks, we can't keep having this baby stuff fed to us. And so what we would do is when a new pastor would come to talk in English worship, we'd say, listen, we've heard it. We've heard enough of Daniel and David and Joseph. We want to hear some more, something more from the scripture rather than just these things. Yeah, like you said, there are some significant lessons we can learn from Daniel, Joseph, David, all these great men and women in the Bible. And um, these are important things and there is a place for it, especially for the youth. And these role models are crucial. That's why they're there in the Bible. However, like you said, I just don't think there's enough substance if we're just talking about how Joseph was faithful and how we should be faithful too. How Daniel was brave and we should be brave too. Because it's still all situated around us and what we should do and how we should be. And the thing is, nobody can always be as brave as Daniel. And nobody can always be as faithful as Joseph. What we needed to hear is that the power of Jesus is working through us and that we need the Holy Spirit to strengthen us and help us to achieve these things. And, you know, I think that in some situations, especially when uh, speakers hear that they've got an audience of women or an audience of youth, I think that they really dilute the scripture down, unfortunately, and give us literally, you know, for lack of better words, the dishwater. Like, after you wash up the water that you're left with, basically. That's what I feel that's, we get sometimes. That's a pretty thought for the mind. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and we don't, you know, we can't get the nutrients that we need from dishwater. And I want to say to speakers, women can handle more than Proverbs 31, believe it or not. And, you know, women can handle more than the scriptures where it says, submit to your husbands, which, by the way, is important. Amen. But <laughs> women need Jesus just as much as men. And, you know, the youth can handle more than Joseph, more than David and more than Daniel. They still need the work of Jesus and what he did for us as well. And we need in our lives God-centered scripture because this only when you hear about God that your life is changed. When you keep hearing about yourself and what you can do, your life is not going to change. And you're not going to be able to come up with all these amazing characteristics in your own life by yourself. We need the power of God. Right, and it, this has been raised many times in our previous episodes. And those of you who have been listening again, thank you for all your support on that. Don't forget to like, subscribe, etc. Now, if you're hearing messages that are basically bigging yourself up and making you feel better about yourself because of an external thing, and that's all that is happening, you would love that, you know? If I got a message about how God is going to bless me, how God is going to give me what I want, and it's about me, 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 and what I can get out of God, it is going to be great for me to listen to that. But it will not produce in me things that Jesus said in terms of repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand or things that Jesus said when he said go through the narrow gate because the narrow way is harder to go through than the broad uh, way and the broad gate so I love the story uh, from the Bible when Jesus is feeding the thousands of men and women and the children and so he's been given these five loaves of bread and two fish and then he blesses it and he hands it out to them and everyone, these thousands of people are all fed and they're all happy. And then Jesus starts preaching the word of God to them. And the moment he starts preaching, people just start dispersing. They start leaving because they have no interest in what Jesus has to say. Uh, for those of you who want the references, John chapter 6 that I'm referring to here. And when these people start leaving, Jesus at no point says, oh, these guys are all leaving. They've, you know, they've they've taken from me my bread. And now when I start preaching the word of God, they've all decided to leave. And so, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to change the method of my preaching. And I'm going to say things that will make them want to stay. However, that's not what he does. He, he in fact, challenges his disciples. He says to disciples, well, why aren't you leaving? Right? This is, this is what I've got to offer. This is what I've got to say. Why aren't you leaving? And then Peter says in verse 68 of chapter 6, uh, Lord, 
To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are Christ, the Son of the living God. What's fascinating is here in that interaction between Peter and Jesus is Peter hears these words from Jesus and says, you have the words of eternal life. It's not the soft, lovey-dovey words that we hear in the pulpit or we claim that Jesus would have said to us if he sees us is the words that are equated to eternal life. It's the strong, double-edged sword words and terminologies that Jesus used that Peter claims to be the words of eternal life. So are we hearing these words in the pulpit? Do we hear that God wants us to pursue a holy life? Or is it just, God loves you just as you are. God wants you to be X, Y and Z, full stop. And to quote Charles Spurgeon, A time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. We need the words of eternal life being preached at our pulpits. The thing with clowns and goats are, if we want the goats to come back to our church, we will have to keep entertaining them over and over and over again, because otherwise they won't come back. But the sheep will come back to the shepherd because they know they can rely on the shepherd that when they go through the valley of shadow of death, the shepherd's staff and rod will come for them. You know, and the devil is a deceiver. He will use things in the scripture to take our attention from the main thing. That's exactly what he tried to do to Jesus whilst tempting him in the wilderness. And he's doing that to us as well today. And we don't even realize it. So we really need to be discerning like Jesus was. And we need to notice when scriptures are being twisted and taken out of context. And, you know, if this happened at university level during one of your lectures, where you were given a primary school level lesson rather than a university level lecture, I'm sure that the whole student body would complain about it and make a huge deal about it and make sure that it doesn't happen again. But for some reason, we have very low standards when it comes to the word of God. And we allow this sort of year seven primary school content to be rinsed and repeated over and over again, which adds very little to people's spiritual lives. And, you know, it just really shows what our priority is. It shows that the word of God clearly is not very much of a priority in our lives because we will take anything that comes our way. We'll take the dishwater. We'll take, you know, things that don't contain the nutrients Uh, We don't care what we listen to as long as we hear something and we've sort of ticked off a box saying that we've listened to a message on Sunday. But if we actually look at how the apostles in the first century church treated the word of God, we see that they treated it with the utmost care and respect. And if we actually read some of the letters that Paul wrote to various churches and various other writers like Peter and John, and, you know, you can see that there's barely any year seven primary school content in that. In fact, some of Paul's letters are hard to understand. Peter says that. It's hard to digest. But the reason being is that the apostles were really concerned with moving people on from milk to solid food. But we're still happy to receive milk. In fact, that's what we prefer at the moment. Uh, But, you know, I think we've made our point here uh, that Pentecostal churches and the congregation needs to pay close attention to their teachings and doctrines and make sure that they're aligned with scripture. And this uh, leads us nicely to the next thing, Uh, we wanted to talk about, which is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. However, I want to focus specifically on tarry meetings. We have no issues with the practice of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, That isn't the issue. Uh, The issue is that the Pentecostal Church as a whole has a huge emphasis on the speaking of tongues aspect over the other gifts. Uh, On the other hand, in traditional churches, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not spoken about at all. Like I don't remember at all in my 22 years of going to a to the Martha my church the gifts of the holy spirit really being spoken about or the practice of the uh, gift of the holy spirit ever being spoken about it definitely happened at prayer meetings uh, where the achin wasn't really there and it was individuals running it but in the church with the achin being involved never really happened anyway i digress let's come back to these tarry meetings uh, i like to refer to them as terror meetings as well but anyway we'll, we'll, we'll call it tarry meetings now to those of you who don't know the tarry meetings are based on the fact that when the apostles received their first uh, visitation of the holy spirit uh, on the day of pentecost they had to tarry they had to wait so they tarried in uh, john mark's upper room And the idea now is that if we want the visitation of the Holy Spirit, like the day of the Pentecost, 
we too need to tarry and wait for the Holy Spirit. And oh, one of the things that must come out of these tarry meetings is the fact, or rather the ability, to speak in tongues. And so when we receive the Holy Spirit, we should receive tongues like the apostles did on the day of Pentecost. Now, the first issue I've got with this is that the day of Pentecost was a one-time event. It happened once. They tarried once for the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit came on the 50th day, hence the term Pentecost. And when the Holy Spirit came, they all spoke in tongues. Uh, there were miracles happening. I think, if I remember correctly, 3,000 people believed and were baptized. And everything happened quite quickly, quite immediately. And following that, let's look at other stories. The house of Cornelius. Cornelius' family didn't have to tarry. The Holy Spirit came on them immediately. And you look at every other story where the gospel of Jesus is being preached and where the Holy Spirit is being spoken about. None of the people had to tarry for a long period of time to speak in tongues. They heard the message. Some of them prayed. The result, however, was always the same. The Holy Spirit fell and they spoke in tongues. They didn't have to wait for an extortionate amount of time. And the tarry meetings that are happening now are not how it happened when the apostles did it in the Bible. I've been to, I think, one or two. I'm pre- I've am i definitely been to one. I may have been to two tarry meetings. And these tarry meetings go on for hours, folks. Okay, And again, the length of time is not the issue. But what they are trying to do in that period of time is what I have an issue with. For example, you hear things like, oh, just clap your hands really hard. Okay, clap your hands really hard and, you know, just let go, release your tongue. Just start saying things with your tongue and then the words, I mean, these tongues will come to you. And, you know, there's, it's kind of like going to an appointment where you want, you have an issue and you're trying to solve that issue. And let's say it's a physio's appointment and they're saying, well, try this now and try this now and try this now. And hopefully, you know, your muscles relax and you, you, you're cured that's pretty much what happens at these tarry meetings. You go to these tarry meetings and the problem is you can't speak in tongues. And they will try different methods to try and get you to speak in tongues. And it is completely unbiblical. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, clap your hands as hard as you can, release your tongue to speak in tongues. And I'm, I'm going to leave it to Chris Lynn now uh, to speak more about her experiences. And at some conferences where they have these tarry meetings, I purposefully just don't go for it because I don't support it. And if I go to those things, it'll be hypocritical of me to go to these things. Yeah, I mean, I've attended quite a few tarry meetings and mm-hmm. fasting prayers in my lifetime. And But I, hold on, with the fasting prayer, I know it does happen there. But the idea of fasting prayer, I think, is more, it's more noble because people have fasted and they're coming together for a purpose. So I think it's a bit different to tarry meetings. Anyway, I'll let you carry on. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. But, you know... Um, for young people, it can be a huge problem, even in fasting prayers. And as a result, young people have a distorted view of who the Holy Spirit is and what his purpose is in the church. Uh, we can see that Jesus, whenever he refers to the Holy Spirit, he actually talks about him as the comforter, the helper. And we have to remember that he's a person. He's not just, you know, a magic thing that happens to us. He is God himself. He has a personality. He has his own will. He has his own way of doing things. And the Holy Spirit's aim is to help us get closer and closer to God. For example, he intercedes on our behalf. When we don't know what to pray, he prays on behalf of us and he convicts us of sin. He helps us repent of our sin, helps us lead a holy life. These are all really key aspects of the Holy Spirit, which I think sometimes in the church gets diluted because the focus is so much on what he gives. His gifts are sort of glorified almost as the ultimate expression of the Holy Spirit working in your life, as the ultimate expression of God's favour in your life. And I think that's completely wrong. And I think this is why a lot of young people, if you actually ask them about the Holy Spirit, they won't really know. Probably the first thing they'll tell you is about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Like, oh, he is basically like when you speak in tongues. Yeah. <laughs> there'll hardly be a mention of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I still remember one of your Sunday school students saying, uh, do you want to recall? 
Yeah, one of the little girls that I taught Sunday school, she was really concerned that she was not getting the gift of tongues. Yeah. And she asked her mom, like, why am I not getting it even though I'm praying for it? Is it okay if I just say something random like gibberish? Is that okay? I, I think her words were, if I said, blah, 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 is that okay? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and her mom obviously clarified and said, that's certainly not okay. That's not what the <laughs> gift of tongues is. But do you see what I mean? Do you see the confusion that this instills in children and young people? They hardly understand that if you do have the work of Holy Spirit in your life, the main thing is, okay, you might have some gifts working through you. Yeah, depending on how God decides to give it. Because exactly. it's a gift, yeah. Because he's the one who gives. Yep. But the main thing that you'll see is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Things like kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. And these things are not focused on as much, even though that is the evidence that the Holy Spirit has actually worked in your heart. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are not necessarily the true evidence. For example... I'm reminded of King Saul, who had this distressing spirit come upon him. And then it says that he prophesied. Now, it wasn't the Holy Spirit who caused him to prophesy in that instance, but it was the distressing evil spirit. So just because someone prophesies or speaks in tongues, that's not necessarily evidence that that is from God. But if they are displaying the fruit of the spirit, the ones that I mentioned earlier, that is clear evidence, just like a tree. If you want to know whether the tree is an apple tree, you've got to see an apple growing on it first of all. Having said that, though, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are really important. They are crucial in the church. That's why the Holy Spirit has given us those gifts. However, if we just reduce him to a giver of these gifts, then we're not really seeing the full picture of God and who he really is. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about my experience in the Pentecostal church. And again, this is not me taking shots at any particular church or pastor. Uh, but when I did attend these tarry meetings and fasting prayers, a lot of the focus during my teen years was on getting a few of us who were baptized to receive the Holy Spirit and therefore mainly speaking in tongues. And like you said, you know, I tried all sorts of gimmicks um, from all sorts of different pastors who've told us to do things like clapping hands loudly, etc., and I saw people around me receiving these gifts and I didn't receive this gift. And it had me thinking, God, what have I done that you don't want to give me this gift? To the point that I sort of dreaded going into these tarry meetings and fasting prayers because I just wouldn't get this experience. And a lot of the focus was on getting this experience. Mm. Uh, and people around me were getting this. And I started thinking that there's something wrong with me, whether it's a sin in my heart. And I started thinking all sorts of things. And I really earnestly prayed to God to remove whatever sin was in my heart that's hindering me from receiving this particular gift. And, you know, sometimes I thought that something happened to me during these fasting prayers and tarry meetings. Like, for example, I don't know, I would ex experienced a really hot flush or a really cold you're, spell. You're a bit too young to be receiving hot flushes, but carry on. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, but I would experience these things in my body and... I can't really tell you whether it was the work of the Holy Spirit or not. I genuinely don't know. Uh, but I think if it was the work of the Holy Spirit, it would always be accompanied by a character change. I mean, Chris, I understand what you're saying. And I'd hate to break it to you, but it probably wasn't the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible doesn't say it comes in cold spells or hot flushes. But you still had those feelings. And those feelings, I think, had to do more with your emotions. You, you being on an emotional high. Okay. And it's because when you're in that environment, right? And we spoke about this before. When when the music is just right, when the lights are dimmed right enough. I mean, in our church, we don't have that. But I'm just talking about in general. We don't have, you know, li dim lights and, you know, really slow music or just, you know, uh, minutes of just music just playing constantly. It doesn't happen. But when we have that happening around us, and when we have really powerful or charismatic leaders saying the right things, we can experience a lot of emotions. And we can always think, oh, the emotions that we're feeling, these hot flushes, these cold spells are the work of the Holy Spirit. But we know from Scripture that isn't the case. And we can get the same feelings if you go to a music concert, right? If I went to an Adele concert, and I'm a big fan of her, uh, singing not her personal life but her singing i would feel the same things chances are that i'd i'd probably cry when i hear uh, someone like you but taking this as evidence that oh this is the work of the holy spirit is completely inaccurate because i'm at an hotel concert and so we've got to look at what the holy spirit did in the first century church okay 
uh, and we need to see if what we are receiving right now is the same thing. And the things that you're saying now, uh, people have confessed to me. Uh, my friends in the Pentecostal Church have said they have babbled in these meetings. They've pretended to have the Holy Spirit. They've pretended to speak in tongues to take the pressure off them. Right? They've faked it till they can make it, and so <laughs> and they still haven't made it. So it happens a lot. There's a lot of emotional things that people go through, and unfortunately. When we look at the scripture, we can see that it's not, I mean, uh, emotions are biblically founded, but the feelings that they, are, they have received are not necessarily from the Holy Spirit. It's just them feeling that way. And if we actually examine scripture and how the Holy Spirit worked when he was giving these gifts, we can see that unnatural, supernatural things have happened. For example, if you look um, in Acts chapter 2, there was the rushing of the wind and there were tongues of fire appearing. These are not things that happen every day. These were supernatural things happening on that day because the Holy Spirit was working. Mm. And I'm not denying that these things can still happen. I'm not denying that these things yeah. do happen. Mm -hmm. But what I am saying is that putting young people in situations where they're in an environment where there's a lot of emotional experiences and bodily experiences going on and sort of giving them the mic and telling them to explain what's happening to them and put, making them almost confess that, yes, this is happening because the Holy Spirit was working through me, even though they're not sure. I think that is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that needs to stop, like, ASAP. Right, and you spoke about how the Holy Spirit is a person and how he has his own will. And in his will, he can give to whoever, whatever gift he wants. Therefore, with the Pentecostal Church placing such a heavy emphasis on the gift of tongues alone, you know, it's often viewed as a pinnacle uh, that you could get in Christianity. It could be wrong because the Holy Spirit might not want to give the gift of tongues over, I don't know, the gift of interpretation. And, you know, the skeptic inside me really makes me think, well, why is it that the gift of tongues is the one that's the most available and the most evident? Why is it so easily available to everyone in the Pentecostal Church? Right? Not just the Pentecostal Church, because a gift of tongues can be found everywhere now. All right, So away from the Pentecostal Church, the Catholic Church have it, the Martha Church has it, the Jacobite Church, any church that you want to think about, now do practice these charismatic gifts. Why is it these gifts that are so available? Right? Why not the gift of interpretation? Why not the gift of miracles? And the reason, okay, this is the skeptic in me that's saying this, the reason why I think it's the most uh, available quote unquote, is because it's the least verifiable, right? With a miracle, if someone's arm is broken and the person goes to a healer and it doesn't get healed, everyone can look and say, well, that hasn't happened. Like if a person prophesies that 2020 is going to be the year of healing and flourishing and COVID happens and the whole world gets stuck, we can point out and say, well, actually, that was wrong. But the gift of tongues, Anyone can say whatever they want and no one can really point and say, well, that isn't the gift of tongues, right? So, you know, it's easy for you to claim that what you're saying is the gift of tongues. And there is no one that can verify it apart from God. Yeah, you know, we can't judge whether a certain person's really speaking in tongues. No, we can't. Yeah, no. Yeah. We need the gift of interpretation for that. And that's right. something that we can pray for. Yeah. Um, and Paul says that we should earnestly desire the gift of prophecy. Now, you don't really see many people earnestly praying for the gift of prophecy and you don't really see many pastors encouraging that either. They'd rather have the gift of tongues, like you say. And, you know, the other thing I want to talk about is that the actual practices in the Pentecostal church regarding the spiritual gifts. And, you know, there's this huge emphasis placed on speaking in tongues during every service, whether it's church service, fasting prayer, tarry meetings, sometimes in cell group meetings as well. There's this huge emphasis and the whole section of time is divided in just for people to speak in tongues together and to worship God. Yeah, and in fact, if the tongues isn't part of the worship, people feel like, oh, worship hasn't happened. Yeah, they feel like, oh, there was no presence of God yeah. uh, in the room. Yeah, that's another word which I have a problem with. But yeah, carry on. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, and the, the idea behind speaking in tongues as a congregation is that when you're speaking in tongues, you're not speaking to men, but you're speaking to God. Let's have a look at what Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Okay, verse 5, it says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So 
when reading this, the point that I get from this is We that, get from this is. Yeah, yeah. That whatever spiritual gifts you're expressing or using in the church must be for the edification of the church. Obviously, personally, in your own time, whatever you can do can be for your own edification. But when you're doing it in the church, it has to be for the building up of the church. So when you speak in tongues, that's great. But nobody obviously understands it except God. And at that point, you're not edifying the church. And it says here, if you have interpretation or someone in the church can interpret those tongues, that's great because that can actually be beneficial to the church. But if not, let's carry on reading and see what Paul's saying. It really sort of clarifies the ways in which the church should utilize these gifts. So let's have a look from verse six onwards. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds such as the pipe or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, mm. if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, mm. how will anyone know what you're saying? Mm, you mm, will just mm. be speaking into the air. Okay, and it's not done. Let's see verse 13 onwards. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. Mm -hmm. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So here, Paul's basically stressing that the parity between the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation is important. They go hand in hand in the church, especially because otherwise, what you're speaking is just uncertain noises that no one else can understand and doesn't really benefit. And what Paul says in verse 18 and 19 really gets to me. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue, right? So Paul, again, is stressing that in the church, he'd rather speak a few words which people can understand than speaking 10,000 words which nobody can understand. And what makes me think is that the time that we spent in gatherings where we dedicate time to collectively speak in tongues is not founded in the Bible. It's completely wrong, in fact, because Paul says the exact opposite. Does that mean that we are doing something wrong? I don't know. But Paul, as one of the founders of the church, is saying that that's not beneficial for a church setting. And again, I want to carry on reading from the same chapter, verse 27. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at most three, each in turn, and let each one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself, okay? This is clearly not what happens in our Pentecostal churches. It's not just two or three words. It's not just one person saying it and another person interpreting it. It's collectively as a congregation saying it all at once and really no, the, no one knows what the other person next to them is saying. And, you know, I have asked about this. Like, why are we still doing this even though Paul clearly says not to do this? And the response I've got is that it says in verse 39, do not forbid to speak with tongues. Now, that last bit where it says, do not forbid to speak with tongues has been used as an explanation as to why we still carry out these practices which are not founded in the Bible. And people will say, well, Chris Lynn, Paul said that bit about not forbidding people to speak in tongues, so we can't stop people from speaking in tongues at church. And that's fine. You can't stop people from speaking in tongues at church. However, are we speaking in tongues like the Bible instructs us to, or are we just doing it in a way that makes us feel something. Because I personally think that what Paul's trying to say is don't forbid people from speaking in tongues in their own rooms, in their own houses, where they want to speak to God and they don't want anyone else to, else to understand. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's the point, right? Paul just spends the whole chapter talking about how to speak in tongues properly and how not to speak in tongues. And in the end, he says, but don't forbid people to speak in tongues. Uh, I mean, it's clear that he's not saying, oh, ignore what I've just said. Yeah. This whole chapter, just ignore everything that I've just said and just pay attention to this one verse at the end. If that was the case, then he would not have spent the whole chapter writing about it. It is clear that he's talking about two different things there. And there, we're just giving an excuse to do the speaking in tongues, which the Bible says to be careful with how you practice it. Yeah. And, you know, some of us might be thinking, well, you know, Paul was just giving us a guideline on how to follow this. It's not like a strict rule. 
But let's actually have a look at verse 37. And here Paul is not beating about the bush. He's being quite direct. He says, if anyone thinks that they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the spirit, let them acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is the Lord's command. So what Paul was writing there was not just Paul giving us some loose guidelines, but he's saying that those were commandments from the Lord himself who actually owns the church. That's what we have to remember, that the church belongs to God and not to us. You know, so we can't do things our own way. We've got to do things the way that God wants us to do. And these gifts that he's given us when we are using it in the church is not for our own edification. But like I keep saying, it's for the edification of one another. So if what we're doing is not helping someone else, then Paul is saying, I'd rather you not do it, you know, in the church. Do it personally, not in the church. Yeah, and it's not just Paul saying it as a director from God. So, folks, we've spent quite a bit of time here speaking about these issues. We've spoken about sermons and how sometimes the sermons can be quite dishwatery and not the nutrients that we need uh, for the growth of the church. We spoke about how uh, tarry meetings, the whole idea behind it is completely unbiblical. And also the practice of the gift of tongues, how it's being practiced in many Pentecostal churches, and well, churches in general, is not biblical either. And I know for a fact that many people will approach me and have questions to ask about this, and please feel free to. But again, it is not our opinion on these matters that matter it's it's what what does god say now, like Kristen said it's god's church it's not ours we aren't here for play church we aren't here to play games with anyone we are reading and listening to the words of almighty god and what does he say about these things that's what we need to pay attention to and it's his church he's the husband he is the shepherd he is the king of kings the lord of lords what he says matters not what we say so i hope this episode has provoked some thoughts in you if you haven't ever thought about any of these topics i hope this has given you something to think about something to look into scripture something to ask questions in your churches it's no it's not intended to cause divisions but it's intended to cause us to really think whether what we have been used to is really from god or are we just comfortable because that's what we've been used to all our lives so like we say we hope this has been useful to you Uh, Please do get in touch with us through the DMs on Instagram or on Facebook if you do want to continue this conversation. But uh, we hope that you've been water to water. God bless you and see you in the next episode.